another sunny day here in Los Angeles, which, like the rest of California, was under Mexican rule from 1821, when Mexico gained its independence from Spain, until 1848. The word Mexico is derived from a people known as the Mexica, which were a group comprised, in part, from descendants of the Toltecs, who occupied the capital of Tula from the second century, but primarily from another group from Tenochtitlan, sometimes referred to as Tenocha, based on the founder Tinoch, ruler of the Mexica, or Aztecs, a more recent term, which is based on Azatlan, their ancestral and mythical homeland that's said to be an island in the middle of a lake, not inside modern Mexico. The Aztecs were led by their patriarch, Tinoch, who was said to be a giant. He was a respected chief whose father allegedly had seven sons with two wives and led his people from Azatlan, which is now Mexico City, around the beginning of the 13th century, which became the capital of the Aztec Empire. You want to feed them? A previous race of giants was said to have existed, which constructed massive pyramids and were later punished by the gods, which will start today's episode right after I feed this giant white goose. For those of you that are wondering, this was an unscripted moment at the park with the only waterfowl that almost always refuses to let me feed it, let alone eat from my hand, but today decided to warm up to me and some new friends. For a little while anyway. Aztec mythology makes it clear that giants inhabited the earth in a bygone era. The same way that myths and religions of the old world speak of a time before Noah, in which the world was destroyed by a flood, or a time of Atlantis, which was ended by angry gods who brought about a cataclysmic deluge. The Mexica, or Aztecs, like the Maya before them, subscribed to the concept of prior worlds, which they called suns, that represented prior ages that were brought to a catastrophic end. Long before Cortez landed on the shores of the New World, the Mesoamericans recalled a time when giants were active in places like Central America, who were both feared and hated by the natives, with terrible wars that were waged against them. But the people were never quite able to completely free themselves from the ruthless giants. Eventually, the gods became tired of the conflict and unleashed a mighty flood on both the giants and the people of the earth. While the Bible speaks of the Nephilim, 
a group of mysterious beings or people of unusually large size and strength who lived both before and after the flood. The ancient Greeks refer to the Titans from Atlantis, who waged war on the other side of the Atlantic in a failed attempt to enslave the entire Mediterranean. The similarities do not end there. In the Aztec story, not only did it rain, but underground rivers were said to burst up from the ground. Compare that to Genesis 7:11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. The fountains of the great deep are subterranean lakes and rivers. I've extensively covered subterranean habitats with bodies of water that are rich in oxygen producing algae in prior videos, which I'll leave a link to in the description. As the Mesoamerican deluge myth continues, those who were not drowned in the flood were in some cases turned into monkeys. The Tlaxcalan of central Mexico have a legend that tells of men in some parts of the world who had survived the deluge turning into monkeys, then slowly recovering speech and reason. It's interesting to note that I've never come across a myth that tells of humanity evolving from primates or monkeys, but it is usually the other way around, where some of the survivors either take to the trees and become simian, or are turned into monkeys by gods, or mate and interbreed with an animal, such as a monkey, to repopulate the earth. The gods had rid themselves of the giants, but not entirely. Some of the cunning giants had managed to elude the flood waters by climbing onto mountains and hiding themselves in caverns. The mighty men sealed the cave entrances with massive boulders and waited there until the waters receded. Having escaped the watery wrath of the gods and determined to create a safe haven to protect themselves from future floods, should the deities become angry again, they constructed the Great Pyramid of Cholula. In one version of the tale, the giants created a race of men to be servants when they emerged from the caverns after the flood. In another version, by the time the giants left their refuge, the god Quetzalcoatl had created humans to populate the earth. In any event, these people would become the servants, ordered to make bricks, and pass them hand to hand, from man to man, in a constant flow of materials to the builders. As the pyramid increased in height, the gods became enraged. They hurled fire down onto the massive structure, destroying the upper portions and killing many of the laborers. Sometime afterward, the pyramid was dedicated to Quetzalcoatl and served as an important religious center. Of course, this resembles, in many ways, the biblical story of the Tower of Babel, which in some religious interpretations, although not explicitly stated in the Bible, involved Nimrod, a grandson of Noah, with Mesopotamian versions of step pyramids called ziggurats, common in ancient Sumeria. In a nod to Greek mythology, the Aztecs had their own variation of the Atlas story. After the world had been destroyed at the end of the fourth sun, the sky had fallen. Like the tale of the Greek Titan who was forced to bear the weight of the heavens on his mighty shoulders, the Aztec gods created four giants to raise the sky and hold it in place. While I've covered the subject of giants extensively in prior videos, which I will also leave links to in the description, I'd like to shift focus now to some esoteric interpretations of the symbolism attributed to the ancient builders of the Cyclopean masonry found all over the world, a type of prehistoric architecture attributed to the mythical giants who, in some cases, were said to have one eye.
In Christianity, the Antichrist is prophesied by the Bible to oppose Christ and as a substitute in his place before the second coming. In the Islamic tradition, an anti-Messiah figure is also spoken about, similar to the Antichrist, who is also expected to deceive humanity. While some attribute an upside-down cross as its symbol, others point to the Baphomet, or goat's head, which I've covered in a video with the link in the description. Another symbol associated with the Antichrist is the pentagram, as well as the number 666, and the name Lucifer, which literally means light bearer. The pentagram is found in the orbital path that the planet Venus makes every eight years. And 666 is holy in the Kabbalah and represents the physical sun. Of course, the eye symbol is also often associated with several goddesses, with Lucifer, as well as Jupiter, the king of the gods. The eye can be found in ancient Egypt, all over the Mediterranean, and even on the back of the $1 bill. It also plays a prominent role as a symbol in mythology and in ancient art. Both Greek and Roman mythology feature a certain race of giants, each bearing a single eye in the middle of the forehead. The word Cyclops, according to Hersiot, actually means circled eye or round eye. Many ancient writers described Cyclops as brothers to the Titans or sons of Poseidon. They were considered a tall race of gigantic size that did not fear the gods. In his work called Theogony, Hesiod goes on to explain, quote, These were like the gods in other regards, but only one eye was set in the middle of their foreheads, and they were called cyclops, meaning circled eye, by name, since a single circled shaped eye was set in their foreheads. Strength and force and contrivances were their works. Three groups of cyclops can be distinguished, the Hesiodic, the Homeric, and the walled builders. In Hesiod's Theogony, written around 700 BC, they are the three brothers who were the sons of Uranus, the sky, and Gaia, the earth, and had a single eye set in the middle of their foreheads. They played a key role in the Greek succession myth, which told how the Titan Kronos overthrew his father Uranus, and how in turn Zeus overthrew Kronos and his fellow Titans and how Zeus was eventually established as the final and permanent ruler of the cosmos. So, Kronos and the Titans represent the Atlantean civilization, which lost the war with the ancient Greeks or Aryan civilization that were represented by Zeus and the gods of Olympus. The Cyclops provided Poseidon with his trident, Hades with his cap of invisibility, a chariot for Mars, Zeus with his thunderbolt, and the gods of the Mediterranean used these weapons to defeat the Titans invading from the Atlantic. In Homer's Odyssey, the hero Odysseus encounters the Cyclops Polyphemus, the son of Poseidon, a one-eyed, man-eating giant who lives with his fellow Cyclops in a distant land. Homer described a very different group of Cyclops than the skilled craftsmen of Hesiod. Homer's Cyclops live in the world of men rather than among the gods and are presented as shepherds who live in caves with no knowledge of agriculture, ships, or craft and live without any laws or regard for Zeus. They have no wine and live on milk, cheese, and the meat of sheep. They live solitary lives, have no government, are inhospitable to strangers, and slaughter and eat all who come to their land. According to Homer, the Cyclops were, quote, an overweening and lawless folk who, trusting in the immortal gods, plant nothing with their hands nor plow, but all these things spring up for them without sowing or plowing, wheat and barley and vines which bear the rich clusters of wine, and the reign of Zeus gives them increase. Neither assemblies for counsel have they, nor appointed laws, but they dwell on the peaks of lofty mountains 
in hollow caves, and each one is a lawgiver to his children and his wives, and they wreck nothing one of another. While Homer is vague as to their location, Euripides and Virgil locate the land of the Cyclops on the island of Sicily near Mount Edna. According to the 1st century BC Roman poet Virgil, quote, In the vast cave of the Cyclops were forging iron. They had a thunderbolt which their hands had shaped, like the many that the Father hurls down from all over heaven upon earth, in part already polished, while part remained unfinished. Three shafts of twisted hail they had added to it, three of watery cloud, three of ruddy flame, and the winged south wind. Now they were blending into the work terrifying flashes, noise, and fear, and wrath with pursuing flames. Elsewhere they were hurrying on for Mars a chariot and flying wheels, eagerly with golden scales of serpents, interwoven snakes, and on the breast of the goddess, the Gorgon herself, with neck severed and eyes revolving. So, this is interesting when he talks about them making thunderbolts, like the many that the Father hurls down all over the earth. Many cultures around the world, including those of Mesoamerica and the Native American Indians of North America, and even in South America, refer to the many bifacial stone spear tips found all over the place as remnants of thunder. These ancient stone spear and arrow tips are called Clovis in the New World and Solutrian in Europe, and many civilizations believe that they were left over from when lightning strikes the ground. That said, it suggests that the Cyclops were forging iron spear tips, which are interpreted as thunderbolts, rather than the more archaic stone tips. Here's an ancient Germanic spear made of iron with a swastika symbol on it. Cyclops were also said to have been the builders of the so-called Cyclopean walls of Mycenae, Tyrans, and Argos, composed of massive stones that seem too large and heavy to have been moved by ordinary men. These master builders were famous in antiquity from at least the 5th century BC onwards. Pliny the Elder, in his natural history, reported a tradition attributed to Aristotle that the Cyclops were the inventors of masonry towers. In the same work, Pliny also mentions the Cyclops as being among those credited with being the first to work with iron as well as bronze. This association with metalsmithing is interesting, as the German scholar Walter Burkert, who specializes in Greek mythology, suggested that the ancient groups of lesser gods mirror cult associations, and that the smith guilds lie behind the story of the Cyclops due to their habit of wearing a single eye patch to protect one eye from the flying sparks that could blind them. This theory was shared by historian Robert Graves, who said, quote, The Cyclops seem to have been a guild of early Hellenic bronzesmiths. Cyclops means ring-eyed, and they are likely to have been tattooed with concentric rings on the forehead in honor of the sun, the source of their furnace fires. The Cyclops were one-eyed also in this sense that smiths often shade one eye with a patch against flying sparks. The connection to the sun also comes up a lot, as another interpretation that I found interesting is relayed by Franz Felix Adelbert Kuhn, a German philologist and folklorist who expanded on Hesiod's etymology for the word Cyclops, which he said meant round eye, and proposed a connection between the first element of the word kuklos which can also mean wheel, and the wheel of the sun, producing the meaning wheel of the sun eyes. As many of you are already aware by now, a sun wheel is another way of saying swastika. So rather than having an eye or a round circle on the forehead, he's implying that it was a swastika on the forehead, where the third eye is traditionally found in Hindu culture. And while in modern times, this is probably most commonly attributed to Charles Manson, 
It also appears on a Japanese cartoon or video game character's forehead, a ninja with the Buddhist manji symbol, as it is called. Another word that means wheel is chakra, referring to the seven primary subtle energy vortexes, including the one behind the forehead known as the third eye, which brings us right to the time of the Silk Road, when Buddhism and Hinduism was introduced to Asia and India, respectively, by ancient Aryans. The Buddha is traditionally regarded as having the 32 characteristics of a great man. These 32 characteristics are also regarded as being present in kings of India as well. In the Buddhist scripture called Digha Nikaya, which means disclosure of the marks, the 29th sign reads, eyes deep blue. A rare trait as only 8% of the world's population has blue eyes, and while this percentage shrinks each year, we can still see remnants of these ancient Aryans who left behind 6 foot 6 inch tall blonde mummies in China next to massive megalithic pyramids which resemble the ones in Egypt and are just as old. These early Aryan Buddhists that introduced this philosophy to three quarters of Asia also left depictions of themselves, including a mark on the forehead representing the third eye chakra, in the ancient Buddhist caves of Bahmian along the Silk Road that was the ancient Aryan trade route connecting the Eastern and Western worlds. We were ready to go out and explore the sites of Bamiyan, a very famous city, in fact, in, in, and an area. The whole valley, the Golden Valley of Bamiyan, is noted for an entire mountain range that was used by the Buddhists as a sacred place in centuries past. And that whole series of mountains there has Buddhist caves in it. Religious priests came here, carved the caves, and when the Muslims came along, many of the caves were destroyed. In fact, the caves were used as residences, and the tar from the fire covered many of the paintings inside, and that sort of saved those paintings. They've been able to remove the tar deposits from the fires of the last few centuries, and they have found Buddhist paintings, some of them of great beauty and color, inside the caves. And we'd like you to join us as we climb through the winding passages of the cliff, passing on the way Buddhist paintings which cover many of the walls and ceilings. And this is done with our portable battery lights as we climb up and up. We're going to be up 175 feet through these caves as we head for the top of the Buddha. We see the red beard and uh, red hair parted in the middle. It's a distinctive style of the Tokarians. He's wearing a coat with wide lapels on both sides and then folded over. It's a shame that these figures have all been defaced by people of other faiths at some time in the past. But it's uh, still, it's very easy to see what they looked like and we can tell who they were. The Tocharian figures are strikingly similar to the mummies that lived in these parts a thousand years earlier. Uh, the wide lapel folded back. He's got the red beard, uh, red hair parted in the middle. This donner has blonde hair and a long nose and an Indian caste mark, which we call a tikka. Mm -hmm. This donner has blonde hair and a long nose and an Indian caste mark, which we call a tikka. Mm -hmm. So he's a local person, uh, Tokarian, uh, but wearing elements of costume uh, that are Sasanian or Persian influenced and has an Indian caste mark. So we see it's a combination of various traits. It is interesting to note that in the Omni Bonum, a 14th century encyclopedia compiled in London, this is how the Antichrist is depicted, seated on a rainbow with a third eye in the center of his forehead.
My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.